let's just start with some quick introductions about uh, who we are and, and the company we work for. So my name is Ed Granger. I'm a consultant with Evolution Software. And uh, as well as working for Evolution, my background is actually as an enterprise architect. So I worked as an EA in financial services for about 10 years and a lot of that on things like application portfolio management exercises. So I have been through multiple rounds of road mapping and uh, I've tried to bring as much of that experience into today's content as possible. So I'll hand over to Tim to introduce himself and just tell you a little bit about the uh, about Evolution itself. Yeah, thanks Ed. So, yep, so I'm Tim O'Neill. I'm, I'm one of the founders for Evolution. So we started the company about 15 years ago and before that I was an enterprise architect um, like Ed as well. You might wind the clock back then. It was a pretty early profession back then but I've certainly been doing this since about the mid 90s um, professionally and worked on lots of interesting contracts around the world and lots of big engagements. And as Ed said, we both work for a company called Evolution which is a um, TOGAF certified vendor and an Archimate certified vendor as well. Right, so I'll just give a bit of an introduction to um, sort of the state of play. So I've given various webinars before with the open group about road mapping. Um, I've looked specifically at how uh, TOGAF as a methodology supports road mapping and the different artifacts um, that TOGAF advocates you should produce. So if you um, can look back through the history of the presentations or we can provide a, a copy of that if anyone's interested in some of the specific ways that TOGAF supports uh, road mapping. Um, and that's been very well received in the past. So that's why we've put together this presentation to really take it to a, another level and a sort of step ahead to give some more basis to the, the kind of objectives that people are trying to satisfy when they are doing road mapping. So for, first and foremost, um, a road map really should chart your course. Now, road mapping is a, I guess we refer to as a horizontal activity. So it's something that every enterprise can do, you know, kind of large or small and the different industry verticals. So whether you're in, you know, financial services or defense or manufacturing, it's, it's obviously appropriate um, approach to follow. What we do find governs the way that people structure their roadmaps is fundamentally the objectives they're trying to meet or the business outcomes they're trying to meet. So whether that's around cost and efficiency savings, whether it's customer needs, risk compliance, um, if you're planning some acquisition and you're looking to try to see how you can bring something, some new division in with you know, synergy savings, that's of course a roadmap. So it's obviously thinking about how you can um, plan for the future but usually with some metrics or some capabilities APIs in mind or some outcomes that you're trying to optimize. Um, so fundamentally to build these roadmaps though, they need to be data driven. So what that means is you shouldn't be looking to draw these roadmaps, you know, pictorially. You know, I don't want to see people dragging and dropping, you know, things on a Kanban plot. You know, that's, that's not an efficient way and an accurate way to make a roadmap. A roadmap should be some living document that's being produced from the ground up based off real data, so from wherever you may be harvesting information from your, your enterprise into your enterprise repository, you should be driving your repository, your roadmap, sorry, through the data that you have as an enterprise. Okay, it should be continually being updated. Okay, so this should be a live dashboard that you should be seeing every day and looking at and your management team should be using to support whatever initiatives they have. You know, this shouldn't be just a pictorial thing you're producing that looks pretty and you know, has graphic designers involved. Okay, it should be data driven. So obviously you should be able to rely on it for accurate recommendations and for insight that you otherwise potentially may not have. So without getting too theoretical on people here, we've done this a lot in the past with some of our um, previous presentations about road mapping. So I, I did a big treatise on, on what's the definition of a road map and looked at some of the different um, popular definitions. Um, here's a couple. So needless to say, not surprisingly, Gartner have a position on what a road map is. TOGAF, of course, defines it as one of the terms in, in section three. Um, and we have um, a version of a road map, a definition if people ask as well. But the one thing you see through here is they all have a concept of time. You know, that's really the main thing that people agree on. So it has some statement about the future. So essentially a when statement, okay? But ultimately something about the future, what might be changing, when it might be changing, how it might be changing, why it might be changing. So ultimately looking into the future and seeing and justifying what the future may look like. But beyond that, it's um, really there's 
lots of different ways you can do this road mapping and that's of course what we're going to try and walk you through here is the different ways you can approach this time dimension. Okay. So, so what we've talked about in the past are four types of roadmaps. Okay. They're all data driven. Okay, so whether it's simply tagging something with a heat map, and we'll go through these in detail, that's fundamentally a what roadmap. A type 2 roadmap is the, the classic Gantt chart or life cycle chart, that's the when roadmap. Okay, the type 3 is where you start to talk about the how, so how is the change going to be affected, you know, what projects, what programs, what work packages are going to be done. And the, the fourth type, which we talk about as a multiple architecture roadmap, is essentially the trade-off approach or the why. You know, why are we advocating you should go down path A versus path B? So it's looking at the alternatives, you start talking about gap analysis, trade-off analysis and things like that. So with that, I'll, I'll pass over to Ed now to sort of go into some details around how we try to guide these four types of roadmaps with what we refer to as success factors. So I guess take it away, Ed. Great, thank you, Tim. So yes, I mean, as Tim referenced, there are really some key success factors that we see, uh, you know, from from clients doing road mapping, and, you know, from my own experience of doing road mapping. There are some definitely some things that uh, that you know we need to focus on to realize value at each stage. So you know, the key the key uh, sort of factors for us are the ability really to to get some early success out, to provide some clear direction very quickly. Uh, and that's, that you know, can't be underestimated. But then we also need potentially to be able to turn that into an executable plan. So most people's idea of a roadmap is something akin to a plan and we need to be able to articulate that. We need to be able to make that plan compelling. So we need to be able to actually you know, get buy-in for the transformations that we're advocating. And we also need to be able to anticipate risks and also you know, look at ways of mitigating those risks. And finally, the fifth thing, we need to keep that current. So we need to keep it up to date, and we need to keep it accurate, and we need to keep it relevant. So each of these five things are what we're going to focus on in this session. And we're going to give you some examples of, of how you can do each of these things. But just to, uh, you know, before we get into the, 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 the mechanics of how we roadmap, we need to look at some of the, some of the foundational work, some of the preliminaries we need uh, to put in place before we start roadmapping. So the first thing to think about is, there are three things really I'd ask you to consider when you're thinking about the preliminaries. And the first thing is really, what are you going to do your road mapping in? So what software, what system, what platform are you going to use for road mapping? Now, we are obviously a software vendor. We will be delighted if you use our product. But really, you know, regardless of what you end up using, there are some key factors here which will impact your choice of platform. And the first one is, as Tim's alluded to, these roadmaps need to be database. So they need to be based on real data and they need to be based on some kind of rigorous method and that gives them credibility. The next thing is they need to be consistent. So it's, it's often the case that you know, teams doing road mapping will have a number of different architects working in different spaces. They might be working in different areas of the business or they might be like infrastructure architects or information architects or business architects or application architects all doing road mapping at the same time. Now, the one thing you can pretty much guarantee is that those roadmaps will overlap. So there needs to be a mechanism for managing the consistency between those roadmaps. Because you don't want, for example, your infrastructure guys saying we're getting off Oracle at the same time that your application guys are saying we're getting on to Oracle. You also, as Tim alluded to, you need to be able to keep these things refreshed and current. And that's very important in terms of keeping pace with, with enterprise change. So, you need to look at whether your, your road mapping tools tick those boxes. And it's very common when people are starting out road mapping, they will use Microsoft Office. I won't knock Office for a moment. It's a fantastic suite of products. But it has some limitations. And you know, effectively managing your roadmaps as standalone assets does have some overheads. So it's worth thinking about those. Now, obviously, this being an open group seminar, we need to talk about standards. And standards are really important in road mapping because they are fundamentally an accelerator. They're things that enable you to get up and road mapping much, much faster. So they provide a whole wealth of things you can use and consume into your, uh, into your roadmaps. So for example, you know, we have things like reference models. So TOGAV has the, the, uh, the TRM, the IIIRM, has some standard models you can use to start to describe the space that you're road mapping in. Now obviously we have methods, 
So we have uh, the, the ADM, particularly phases E and F, um, which will actually, you know, they go into quite a lot of detail about how to do things like shape up work packages and understand the touch points with, you know, migration activities. Meta models are very important, um, particularly when you are working with data. You need a framework for organizing your, your data, regardless of whether you're dealing with uh, portfolios of applications or processes or technologies. You need to have a way of modeling and representing that data and understanding how it connects to the things around you. And also in terms of templates and notations, we need a way of actually presenting or visualizing those roadmaps. And again, standards like Archimate give you a rich language for actually presenting out those roadmap concepts. Now, I'm a big fan of standards, but there is a caveat here. The most important thing really is to land your roadmap with your stakeholders. So that requires some flexibility in terms of how you're going to present the roadmap in Capital Lab. So you need to, you know, approach the standards as something that can give you a, a, a running start, but at the same time, you need to actually be sympathetic to the needs of your stakeholders who may not be technical at all and may require a much looser way of articulating the, the roadmap. So the third thing, and this is really, really important when we're talking about road mapping, you're going to be working with a lot of data. So regardless of whether you're working with a lot of applications, a portfolio of applications or processes or technologies, you typically will be working with a lot of data. And you need to actually manage that data as a shared asset to prevent it becoming an overhead. Not just an overhead, I can speak from personal experience of road mapping initiatives I've been involved in where the data has got out of control. And that can actually derail your whole road mapping initiative. If you know, version control is out of step or people are working up different versions of the data, that can be a major problem. So you need to have some management around that information. And the other thing is don't reinvent the wheel. Don't go out and gather all this data fresh. You, know, you have this data in your enterprise. So you'll have existing inventories. You, know, you might have things like CMDBs. Um, you may well have diagrams, which have a list of applications or processes on them. These are all rich sources of information you can use to start to accelerate your road mapping. But again, going back to the tooling question, you need some way of actually scooping that data in. So integration is a must when it comes to bringing that data in. So those are really some preliminary things to think about. Now, let's get on to the first of our success factors, which is providing clear direction fast. So in my personal experience, often, you know, when you're starting out road mapping, people request a roadmap because there's a strategy gap. And what I mean is that, you know, we'll be looking at an area, for example, the application portfolio and saying no one knows what the strategy is for these applications. So, you know, it's not so much there's no business strategy, it's like it might be there's no technical strategy. But nonetheless, the first thing we need to do is provide some kind of clear line of travel or some clear strategic direction. And the best way to do that is with a heat map. And a heat map is what Tim alluded to in our four road mapping styles as a type one road map. And a heat map is very simple. It's basically we work with a portfolio, for example, of applications or technologies, and we tag each one of those things with some kind of strict statement of strategic intent. Fundamentally, we're saying, do we want to take it forward? Do we not want to take it forward? If we want to take it forward, how do we want to take it forward? And then we can use that, obviously, to color a view of our portfolio. Now, this is almost ridiculously simple, and it's so simple that many people don't even think of it as a roadmap. But don't underestimate you know, the, the power and the benefits you can get from having a very simple visualization of your estate and some kind of easy to understand view of the intent around that. Because, for example, it gives you an idea of where projects should be investing, or it gives you an idea fundamentally of where you need to be managing risks or managing suppliers. You can get immediate value from this kind of very, very simple heat mapping. But again, one from experience, just be sure that you have all your bases covered. If you're proposing, for example, to decommission your business's billing platform, make sure you understand what's going to replace it, because I guarantee your business customers will not be happy if you propose you should stop billing their customers. So when it comes to actually determining, you know, those heat maps, there are a few approaches out there to tagging. And, you know, some of the common ones are, these are really standard list of tags. So these are standard values you can put against each of the items in your portfolio to describe what the intent is. So some of the common ones are the time rating, so that's tolerate, invest, migrate, eliminate, four R's, retain, redesign, refresh, retire, mainstream, contain, replace. These are just different ways of describing what the intent is for each of those applications or each of those processes or technologies. Now, 
How you come up with those tags is kind of up to you. They may be very subjective, so you may just simply get a, a, a list of business experts or technical experts in a room and ask them to, you know, to come up with one of those ratings for each element. Or you may take a more data-driven approach. So for example, in the application portfolio management space, it's very common to use measures such as business fit and technical fit to actually determine what the ratings should be for each of those applications. So for example, business fit would be, in the case of an application portfolio management exercise, would be the extent to which the, the application provides the business capability, or the extent to which it's reliable and available, or the extent to which it's cost effective. Whereas technical fit might be the extent to which it's maintainable, or the extent to which it actually complies to technical strategy. So on the right-hand side at the top here, we have a very simple bubble chart, which is basically just showing those key business versus technical fit dimensions for a very small application portfolio. And that's enough to start categorizing those applications into one of those, uh, one of those tags or categories. Now, there are some other examples of heat maps at the bottom of the page. There's a so-called sunset chart at the, uh, the bottom right. Um, so there are many, many different ways of actually visualizing uh, the, the, the heat maps. But in virtually all uh, cases, they use color basically to describe the strategic intent for the portfolio. Now, something we are very keen on in evolution, and Tim already alluded to, is that it's very important that we can you know, actually generate stuff at will. Um, so we use dynamic visualizations. We use uh, basically data visualizations to be able to, to provide heat maps for portfolios. And these can come in multiple styles, and the beauty of them is they can run on the same data. But one of the nice things about them is that they can be generated continually. So they, they are an automated presentation layer that you can run on top of your, your roadmap data. Now, as Tim alluded to up front, really, you know, often when we're doing things like roadmapping for applications or technologies, it's being driven by a technical strategy view. But it doesn't have to be. So there are a number of different drivers why we might do roadmaps. And they will determine you know, both the area of the architecture we're roadmapping, so for example, business processes or applications, but also the criteria we're using to roadmap. And here, we've just pulled out an example compliance use case. So this is the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, the new EU regulation which is, is being enforced from next year. And this is really just taking a high-level view of business processes and identifying the ones which we believe are in scope for GDPR. And then instead of actually heat mapping by things like business or technical fit, we're actually business, uh, we're, sorry, we're uh, heat mapping by the actual, the, the, uh, the, the regulation, so the particular provisions or particular articles of the regulation and what it asks us to comply with. So there's a bunch of different use cases we can use this heat mapping approach for. Um, just one to keep my marketing team happy. We have a white paper on GDPR. It's something that a lot of our, our customers are asking us for right now. So if you're interested, go onto our site and download it, or otherwise just get in contact and we'll happily send you a copy. So as Tim alluded to, heat mapping gives you what? It tells you basically what your strategic intent is. But obviously, you know, it doesn't provide any view of timescales. It doesn't provide any view of dependencies. It doesn't provide any view of activities. Now, this, in the classic sense, is what something like a Gantt chart does. So a Gantt chart will absolutely show you those tasks and those dependencies. The flip chart is, sorry, the flip, the flip side is, a Gantt chart doesn't actually give you any view of the architecture. So we kind of need a bridging artifact or bridging artifacts that are actually going to be able to represent our architecture in more of a plan-based uh, sort of view. And there are a couple of ways we can do this. So the first is that we actually start to apply more granular time information to our architecture. And typically, we'll do this as life cycles. But also, we need to understand what's going to drive us. What's actually going to take us from the as is to the 2B? You know, what, what, what's actually going to drive the activity of getting from one architecture state to another? And this is where we start to articulate work packages. So let's start with life cycles. Every element in your architecture, be it a technology, a process, a business product, data, potentially applications, regardless of which area of the architecture you're working in, every element potentially has a life cycle. And you, know, you can categorize these different ways, but I like to categorize them basically into two categories. Those things that your organization controls, which might be something like a product launch or the decommissioning data of an application, and those things it has no control over. 
So those life cycles which are simply imposed on you. So a very common one, for example, is vendor product life cycles. So for example, when is a particular version of SQL Server going out of support? Now, you can get that information from resources like Technopedia. So if you're looking to actually provision that information into your roadmaps, don't necessarily feel you have to log on to everybody's site and actually look on the product page to understand when support dates are. Now, other types of life cycles you might have imposed on you are just things like GDPR, regulatory deadlines. So at minimum, to do life cycle modeling, um, you need to have a from date and a to date. So you need to have the date in which this thing comes into existence and the date in which it, it goes out of existence. And that's the minimum you need um, for life cycle modeling. But one of the powerful things about life cycles is that you can actually chunk the life cycle of an element, like an application or process, up into a number of phases. And what these phases do is they enable you to start to uh, you know, give more context-sensitive guidance for things like investment and governance decisions. So the graphic at the bottom is showing an application, application C, and it's showing it's going through a number of phases which are sort of typical for a lifetime of an application, from obviously you know, initial evaluation development, into deployment, into some kind of growth phase, and then it reaches a steady state. And then at some point, we start to migrate data and processing off it. And we might you know, archive it or just decommission it outright. Now, if we have this kind of lifecycle information, we can start to actually make more nuanced, uh, more context-sensitive governance and investment uh, decisions around it. So for example, if we know that from the middle of year seven, we're going to be migrating data or processing off this application, then we might want to close it. We might want to close the doors to the business and say, no, you're not going to put any more business or any more products onto this application at the beginning of year seven. So we can actually use time-based criteria to start to govern our investment and govern, um, you know, uh, and, and, you know, a drive governance. So the other great thing about life cycles is they enable us to start to understand dependencies. So for example, if we're working with a given area of the business, a given business line or a given function or a given capability, we can actually take a look at the applications, for example, or the processes that support that particular functional capability and understand when, you know, for example, a legacy application is being decommissioned and when its replacement is coming into service. And what this means is we can start to identify timing mismatches. So we can see, you know, for example, we have at the bottom, we have an example report which is generated from Abacus. And I've just highlighted one area of that. And what the report's doing is actually just some very simple conditional formatting. It's looking, for example, where the replacement application is not going to be ready in time uh, to match the expected or the planned decommissioning date of the application that's supposed to be replacing. So life cycles enable you to start to find the gaps in your plans and to start to understand where you might need to move activities in or you might need to push you know, the lifetime of a legacy application out for a little bit longer. So life cycle is a very, you know, a very good way of articulating when things are going to happen, but we still haven't actually discussed how we're going to get from our as is to our 2B. And you know, the way to do that is we need to start modeling the work. We need to start modeling what we call work packages. Now, TOGAF has a great uh, definition of what a work package is. Fundamentally, it's any set of activities. So it could be very granular, it could be an individual activity, or it could be a whole program. Um, so it doesn't really matter on the scale. The important thing is the work package is what's going to drive you from where you are to where you want to be. And if we start to model work packages explicitly, we can also start to understand some additional things. We can understand how those work packages are dependent on each other in a classic Gantt chart type style. Or we can understand, uh, I should say, and we can understand how those work packages are impacting the various elements you want to transform in your architecture. So the processes or technologies or applications or whatever. In terms of you know, the actual physical way for modeling work packages, it's very common for us to use diagrams in this space. So I guess we have an example of what we call a type three roadmap here. This is actually an Archimate uh, diagram. And the red boxes uh, towards the bottom of the diagram are actually work packages and work package dependencies. So we can understand how these work packages relate to each other. We can also understand how the work packages relate to various states of the architecture. You know, your, your baseline, your as is, your target, your to be, and any number of transition architectures. 
But as Tim's alluded to, you know, it's not just about diagramming. This is a data-driven approach, and so we can represent that data in different ways. So we can use different views, for example, to understand, you know, different aspects of these work packages. So, for example, we can use matrices. And these will help us to understand not just the impacts, what those work packages are impacting, but also where there are actual or even implied interdependencies between work packages. So, for example, where we have multiple work packages that are actually going to be impacting a single application, we then might want to look at actually either putting a dependency between those applications, between those work packages, or actually bring them together as a single consolidated unit of work. The other big advantage of holding this information as information or as data, as structured data, is that it makes it much, much easier to exchange it with your, with your project management, your program management office, uh, who you know, may well have a PPM tool, uh, which you know, they will actually use to set up projects and programs and to understand benefits, understand dependencies, et cetera. So you can either define, as an architect, define candidate work packages, which you can then export and let them you know, consume those into their own environment you know, for, for that kind of um, scoping. Uh, or you can actually consume the other way. You consume lists of either planned or actual project activity into your EA tool and then consume that into your roadmap. So you can take real projects into your roadmaps and link them into the things which they are transforming. So that's kind of the, the mechanics of drawing a roadmap. You know, so we've looked at the what, we've looked at the when, we've looked at the how. As Tim alluded to, really, the really important thing is understanding the why. And this is where we actually start to need to build a story around the benefits of road mapping. And from my own experience, this is somewhere where architects often struggle. It's not easy to do. Uh, so, but one trap it's quite easy to fall into as an architect is that assuming that the benefits are at some level self-evident. So, for example, if we have a, you know, a, a, a picture which describes our current application state and all its integrations, and it's like a hairball spaghetti architecture, and it looks horrible, and then we have a 2B architecture which has some you know, nice rationalized messaging bus or you know, big data lake or whatever, often as architects, we will instinctively say, this is better. But we have to bear in mind that not all our stakeholders are architects, and the difference may not be as obvious to them. So fundamentally, we need to be able to articulate the benefits of roadmaps in business-relevant uh, KPIs or key performance indicators. And we need to be able to demonstrate how these are moving us closer to our organization's objectives. So there are a number of different KPIs you can use. Ones we commonly work with around architecture are things like financial KPIs, so total cost of ownership, you know, capital expenditure. Also, what we call the non-functionals. Um, so non-functionals apply at an architecture level, absolutely. Um, things like the performance. So can your architecture scale to process business volumes? Is it reliable? You know, what's the proportion of the time when it's up or down or unavailable? Is it agile? So what's the time to market? You know, we've already looked at risk. That could be like a, an information security risk or a compliance risk or even just broad complexity. Now, there are other KPIs which would be very meaningful to your business and ones that it may be harder um, for an architect to articulate. So there might be you know, customer attention or the volume of new business coming in. Regardless, at some level, we need to be able to link our architecture to one of these KPIs. And the graphic at the bottom really just shows, you know, in very simple terms, much simpler to draw than it is to do, um, you know, the principle behind that. So we have a baseline architecture, and we should be able to measure that for cost or performance or agility at some level. We have a target architecture. We should be able to measure that by the same KPIs. It's very important we're able to measure both states by the same sets of KPIs. And we need to relate those to our organizational objectives. And so the roadmap is not just showing the transition between architectures. It's showing the transition between two views of performance or two states of performance, a current performance view and a projected performance view. So in terms of the mechanism for doing that, um, you know, you, there's a whole range. You can work with some very simple estimates, or you can get quite advanced, and you can actually, you know, get into quite deep cost modeling or performance modeling. But fundamentally, each of the elements on your roadmap, you know, where it's a technology or a process, it has properties. And those properties will be things like its cost or its availability. So we have the properties which enable us to actually express the performance, either individually or on aggregate of those elements. 
And then the time dimension is going to show us how those things change over time. So how those properties will change over time. So for example, you know, we have at the bottom, on the bottom right, a, a chart, and each of these kind of roller coaster ride looking uh, curves is actually an individual, an individual application. It's cost over the course of you know, one, two, three, four, five years. So we can see if we relate it to the life cycle chart above it, some of these applications are being decommissioned, therefore their cost you know, falls off a cliff. Some of them are kind of ticking along nicely, in which case the cost may stay fairly steady, or it may even grow slightly over time. Doing this kind of cost modeling can be quite, uh, quite advanced. So uh, certainly in evolution, we make a lot of use of algorithms. We use algorithms to model things like financials or performance or availability. Uh, and this is one way to actually accelerate the kind of calculation of those benefits. Now the other thing we can do, going back to our work packages, if we have articulated those work packages, then obviously we can actually associate measures with the work itself, not just with the portfolio we're actually trying to transform, we can associate things like cost with our individual projects. And we can actually apply this, so we can see when that change cost is actually going to apply into a portfolio. So again, we have a, a kind of a, a chart here showing, again, an application portfolio over the course of several years. Um, in this case, it's stacked, so we can see each of these lines still represents an application, but this time there's one on top of the other, so we can more easily see the, the aggregated view of the total cost of that portfolio. But we can also see in year two, for example, there's a spike, there's a spike in, co in cost, because that's when our change costs are applying, and that's where, when we're actually investing to actually decommission applications and, and migrate their business from our sort of legacy applications to our strategic applications. Now, hopefully, if we've done that correctly, then we should get to a lower baseline over time. And really the gap between our starting uh, level and our, our finishing level, that's the benefit. And for, for us, as architects, understanding the cost benefit really uh, is down to understanding the, you know, the short-term expenditure and the longer-term benefit. And obviously that's not just a financial calculation, that benefit might have to be rep repaid within X years, or if you're a particularly unlucky, X months. Now the key thing about these, these estimates or these figures that they are estimates, you know, obviously we can't know for sure how much it's going to cost in the future. So we need to continually refine the numbers. And as our strategy evolves, we need to be able to regenerate these type of views. So one thing, so some of the guys on the call, I'm sure, you know, uh, are just getting started with road mapping. They're kind of just wanting to know how do I, how, how do I even get going? I guarantee there'll be a certain number of guys uh, who've been through this exercise a few times, and they kind of say, yeah, yeah, the theory's nice, but you know, I think anyone who's done road mapping uh, at least a couple of times has probably uh, had their fingers burnt, um, because it's a sad truth that a certain proportion of roadmaps just don't make it to execution. And there's a great quote from the, the poet Robert Burns. I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to paraphrase it, um, but the best laid schemes of mice and men often go awry. It's certainly the case that roadmaps, no matter how compelling they are, no matter how much effort you put into them to actually articulate work packages and articulate benefits, they can be derailed. And often, you know, what, what does that is unforeseen impacts. So obviously, you're going, you know, you're, you're planning, you're taking a step towards execution, but you don't know everything at that point, and things can come out of the woodwork. Now, if you're particularly unlucky, those things may be complete showstoppers. So it may be something you, you hit an immovable object. There's no getting around it, there's no getting over it. It just stops you dead. That happens sometimes. But another thing that's very common is that, you know, what we call the death by a, a thousand cuts syndrome. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by this. Let's say we have an application we're looking to decommission. That application has 20 integrations, 20 interfaces worth of other applications. So what we do is we estimate the cost of decommissioning the application. We estimate the cost of rebuilding the integrations to our new strategic application. When we get further into execution, we find out the application doesn't have 20, it has 30 integrations. And then when we get further, we find it doesn't have 30, it has 40. So incrementally, the cost of replacing that app, the cost of doing the reintegration of your strategic app is climbing up and up and up. And it's not just a cost issue, it can push your time scales out and out and out. So at some point, there is a risk that you're actually going to breach that cost-benefit uh, balance. And effectively, the thing becomes too expensive or too slow or whatever. 
um, to actually execute. You know, the, the, the shine has come off your roadmap. So how do we actually deal with these? Uh, how do we actually minimize these risks? Well, I'd love to say there's a magic answer. I'd love to say we have an algorithm for it. Um, I'm sure we're working on one, but we haven't uh, released it to market yet. But, you know, fundamentally, you need to understand the context of your roadmap. So there's some very simple things, some, you know, some relatively straightforward things that architects can do to minimize risk. There's nothing we know of you can do to remove the risk. But there's some simple uh, areas that architects often go wrong. And one of them is not really understanding the context of what they're, what they're road mapping. So for example, you might be road mapping a technology, you might be road mapping an application. Really regardless of which part of the architecture you're working in, that application or technology is just part of a stack of things which include people and process that deliver some kind of business benefit. And it's often the case, for example, if we're looking to decommission an application, we don't really understand the business impacts of that. So we might understand we can replace it with another application, but we don't understand, for example, whether a product needs to be maintained on it or whether data needs to be maintained for several years. So understanding the end-to-end -end context is quite critical. And I've got on the right-hand side here, I've got an example of what we call our world according to uh, diagram. This is an automatically generated diagram. Uh, and basically what it does, it starts from a given part of the architecture, such as an application, and says, okay, and now I'm going to track the dependencies that application has down the stack, down to the infrastructure, potentially down to the network, and up the stack, up to business processes, up to departments. So understanding those impacts is fairly key. Now, you don't always have the data you need to actually track all those impacts, and that's where you know, we're very keen on a, on a technique we call inference. We actually use algorithms to do it, um, but you can do it manually. That's really just understanding how to infer what you don't know. So for example, if we have an application and we don't know whether or not it talks to our billing application, so we have a sales app, we don't know if it talks to our billing app, but we do know that the sales process that uses it talks to the billing process. So we can start to infer what some of the integrations or dependencies might be even when the data is missing. Now, going back to our cost chart, I, I uh, emphasize it's very important to keep regenerating and re-quantifying those benefits. So in the kind of death by a thousand cuts scenario, you need to understand you know, when your benefits case is starting not to make sense anymore. And that means continually being able to remodel those benefits. But also for the kind of showstoppers, you know, there's no there's no guaranteed way to identify a showstopper, but, but one kind of useful rule of thumb is look for the things. So some things you can renegotiate. So if it's a, a dependency internally, you know, often within your own business or within your own organization, you can renegotiate those things. But things like compliance or contractual uh, you know, blockers with third-party organizations or regulators, they're much harder. So it's good practice then to start with the things which are going to be hard to move start with the things which are likely to be showstoppers and just look to see for your roadmap, is it likely to hit any of these things? But the good news is some of these things disappear over time. So there are windows of opportunity. Things that are blockers today may actually disappear at some point. You know, so a business product that, that the business need to keep selling for the next you know, 18 months and you can't do anything until they finish that, at some point they may decide, right, that product's run its course. And that then may give you a window of opportunity for actually getting off a technology or getting off an application. So the last success factor, the fifth success factor we kind of alluded to is keeping it relevant. And actually, this is just, a, this is just a, another way of saying we need to be agile. So when we're talking about agility, we're really talking about agility at two levels here. And the first level is what we call strategic agility. And this very simply means that I've already alluded to the fact that your roadmap should be taking you closer to a set of objectives. And those objectives will be the measurable components of your business strategy. But business strategy changes. You know, and that's often driven by things like market changes or regulatory changes. You know. So sometimes you're at a risk of putting all your eggs in one basket. Um, by, by having, for example, a roadmap which is purely driven by the need for cost savings, only to find that you know, the market's actually a bit more buoyant and your business are looking for growth over cost savings. So sometimes having one end state you know, isn't enough. And this is when we need to start thinking about scenarios. So architecture scenarios are basically when we have different future states of the architecture 
optimized for different objectives. So as I say, we may have a, a scenario based on cost, we may have a scenario based on service, and we may want to compare that to a scenario based on one optimized for business growth. So in the same way that we can project future architectures and then measure their performance on things like financial or you know, uh, availability um, measures, we can potentially have more than one architecture. So there's a couple of uh, examples of what we call a type four roadmap on the right hand side. Um, on one, we have three scenarios. So we have a path from the historic state to an as is state to one of three 2D states, each of which has different performance or availability service characteristics. We can also, at the bottom, and I know Tim, this is one Tim worked on uh, with a client probably about, ooh, I don't know how long ago, Tim, but anyway, in this case, we actually have um, two scenarios, but they're ending up pretty much in the same place. But I know that they represent different execution paths. So they represent doing the same activities, doing the same work products in a different order. So they represent different paths effectively to get to the same endpoint. So the second level that we need to consider agility in is really change agility. And if you've been part of an agile project, you know, if you're a Kanban or if you're Scrum or whatever, this is what we're talking about. I think one of the big challenges for architects in the 21st century is we need to simultaneously move at scale and at pace to stay ahead of change. And this is really, really important because as soon as an architect falls behind the people they're trying to lead, they lose their credibility. You know, it might be fun to say, I told you so, while you're running after the crowd. But really, it's, you know, at that point, you've lost your ability to influence. So there's a definite risk, you know, with, with things like agile uh, projects and with, you know, the easy availability of things like infrastructure and applications via cloud or SaaS, that is, there's a definite risk that the, the road mapping process may take so long that actually your, your development team have already implemented or partially implemented uh, before you finish that planning phase. And so, you know, we need to think about how we stay ahead of that curve. We need to think about how we do this road mapping, potentially for a large portfolio of processes or technologies. We need to think about how we do it in an agile way. Now, the first thing Tim's already alluded to, we need to automate. And this is one reason why we're very keen to have a data-driven approach. Data isn't just about having a fax right, it's about the fact we can automate the process. So we can automate the collection of the data, we can automate the actual visualization and production of the insight and the analysis. We need to underpin our roadmaps. And you've seen some of these artifacts on the right-hand side before, but the reason I brought them up again is because these are all artifacts which can be completely automated. So they can be run every week, every day, every five minutes, probably if you want, uh, you know, but they can be continually refreshed. And so all the architects have to do is to maintain that little bit of data which is actually showing the strategic intent and dependencies. So the next thing is, you know, keep it simple. You can draw very elaborate roadmaps, but often, particularly when you're trying to be agile, you know, minimalist, less is more. So have enough to make sure that people understand the journey, but don't try and specify it to the nth degree because things will change. Now we've referenced the fact we can use algorithms, and this is one of the ways that we stay agile is by using those algorithms to, to continuously remodel the benefits, so remodel the financials, or remodel the, the availability calculations, or remodel the performance, complexity, whatever your performance measures are. You can use the algorithms, basically when, whenever the data is refreshed, they will actually do a fresh cut and they will do a fresh analysis, which can then be presented out again. And again, you know, focusing on the outcomes is important. So absolutely a roadmap should, you know, should describe at some level how you get from A to B, but don't over-specify the journey. Particularly with agile projects, you know, you're gonna to want to allow the guys on the ground some leeway to determine you know, how they're gonna execute. So it's far preferable in that case to allow them to determine the path rather than the destination. You know, you know where you want to go, I think you have to trust in those guys to a certain extent, particularly when it gets down to the fine-grained level, how they're going to get there. And the best way to do that is to make sure that your roadmaps are very broadly understood, they're broadcast out there, people know where to find them, people understand them. So getting those artifacts out there, getting them socialized, not just with your stakeholders, you know, not just with the guys who are going to pay for this activity, 
but with the guys who go and execute this activity is very important. So that's kind of it for the, you know, the trip through those kind of four road mapping styles. So I'm just going to quickly recap before we finish. So the four styles of road mapping, broadly speaking, tagging and heat mapping will give you a description of the what. They'll give you clear strategic direction. Type two, life cycle charts will tell you about the when. They'll show you when things are going to you know, be commissioned or decommissioned or go from one phase into another. If you want to articulate the how, these are where we actually start looking at work packages and understanding how those work packages impact both the architecture and drive each other. And finally, around the why, this is really about the way we articulate the benefits. And one way of doing that is for our type four, our multiple architectures roadmap, to actually quantify the different, you know, effectively financial or non-functional or performance criteria uh, that our roadmaps can, can you know, deliver to the business. So those five success factors, provide clear direction fast, turn strategy into a plan, make it compelling, make sure people understand why you're doing it, manage those risks, and keep it current and keep it relevant. So that's pretty much uh, the end of the slides. I think we've had some questions while we come in. Um, I'm going to leave this up here. So we have a road mapping white paper. If anybody wants more details, they can either get in contact with myself or Tim. They can also go on to our, our uh, Avolution site and download that white paper.